Hi folks, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. We're allowing all of our colleagues to come in. Okay, we're going. Welcome back. Welcome to the closing plenary of People Power Impact. I would say that we have certainly experienced all three over this last day, uh, two days actually, I was going to say day and a half, over this last two days. What a powerful, powerful conference we've had this year. It is always so wonderful. Can you imagine over 400 of us have gathered over the last two days to chat with each other? Um, and now it's time for our final keynote address. But before we hear from Dr. Waldron, just some housekeeping. You know at Ocasi, we love to boast about our work and we have a new project to tell you about. Um, you know that we've been paying particular attention to women and women's organizing. The panel this morning from the women's, the Ocasi Women's Caucus um, had over a hundred participants. I, eavesdropped for a while this morning, and it was a dynamic, dynamic conversation happening. Our new project is the Racialized Refugee and Immigrant Women's National Alliance. This project is about exploring the need and feasibility of a pan-Canadian, bilingual, anti-racist, and intersectional feminist alliance that could be a national collective voice of racialized refugee and immigrant women, including trans women and non-binary people on gender equity and racial justice. Okasi recognizes the important work being done by grassroots organizations such as yours and other community led movements across the country. We are still in the early stages of setting up this initiative and are welcoming folks from across the country to join in with us. Please contact Leah Woolner or visit our webpage for more information about the project. Visit ocasi.org, www.ocasi.org for more about the project. And remember our pandemic stories. Yesterday morning to open our conference, you saw some of the stories. We couldn't play you the video, but we will. Um, it's, on our, it's on our website. Please send us your stories at policyevents at ocasi.org. That's policy events at ocasi.org. We want to hear about the wonderful ways you have been responding to the pandemic individually, as a program, as an organization, as someone active in your community. Let's talk about how it is that we have been able, as a sector, to really make a difference in the lives of the communities with whom we work. I also want to take this opportunity to say our thank yous. Thank you to our funders, IRCC at the federal level, Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, MLTSD at the province, Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development, but also MCCSS where immigration services were located until fairly recently, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And of course, the United Way of Greater Toronto, who for almost 40 years have supported the policy and advocacy work of the council. Thank you to the Ocasi conference team, the policy and research team, and especially Stephanie Brown, who has really led us through this wonderful, wonderful two days. Thank you to our ASL and English French interpreters, to our tech colleagues at ProShow Audiovisuals, Daryl, thank you so much. And thank you to my colleagues at Ocasi our managers, our staff in all of the programs. Thank you for stepping up as always, for being there to support, for showing up for your colleagues. Thank you, you've all contributed to making this last two days such a powerful and successful conference. And now, we are so looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Waldron. Dr. Waldron will deliver a keynote address on centering social justice in environmental justice and climate change movements and how communities and sectors in Canada 
can counter anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism in environmental and climate policy. We know that her address will serve to inform and inspire you and all of us at Okasi um, as refugee and frontline practitioners in your day-to-day -day work for equity and justice for refugees and migrants. Let me introduce Dr. Waldron to you. Dr. Ingrid Waldron is the HOPE Chair in Peace and Health in the Global Peace and Social Justice Program in the Faculty of Humanities at McMaster University. Her research interests focus on ecological violence and the structural determinants of health. She's the author of There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities, which was turned into a 2020 Netflix documentary of the same name. There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities. Check out that documentary, folks. Dr. Waldron is the founder and director of the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, the Enrich Project, and is a co-founder of the Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition. She is the recipient of many awards, a few being the Research Canada's Leadership in Advocacy Award from Dalhousie and Springtide Collectives Advocate of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ingrid Waldron. Dr. Waldron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Debbie, and thanks for inviting me and thank everyone for attending. Okay, let me put up the slide. Is that good? You can see this? It's good. Great. So I wanna begin uh, with a quote from a 20 something environmental activist in the indigenous community in Amjinwang First Nation, where, which is near uh, Sarnia, Ontario. It's a community that's often referred to as uh, Chemical Valley. Vanessa says, the land is our mother. So when we lose value for the land, people lose value for the women. Indigenous and Black women have been building grassroots environmental and social justice movements for decades to challenge the legal, political, and corporate agendas that sanction and enable environmental racism and other forms of violence in these communities. Colonial gendered violence continues today and includes the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, the displacement of Indigenous peoples from their lands by corporate resource extraction projects, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous police violence, and other forms of state-sanctioned violence. Colonization and genocide are tied to the intersections of Indigenous lands and bodies. Women experience violence because they are the ones that are responsible for taking care of the land and holding it for future generations. Therefore, gendered violence that harms women specifically also harms nations, making it much easier to take possession of the land. For Indigenous women specifically, production and reproduction, land and life, and resistance and survival are all intimately connected. There is no separation. Therefore, the Indigenous role in fighting against environmental racism by defending their land and territory and protecting their water are acts of resistance against gendered oppression. So when I started the Enrich Project back in 2012, um, journalists and members of the public uh, asked me often, what is environmental racism? It was a term that they couldn't really get their head around. So, uh, some of the questions included, um, how can the environment be racist? Which is a fair question because it is a, a peculiar term. Um, so I thought it was really important for me to start uh, creating more awareness around environmental racism through public engagement events and workshops. Now, one of the workshops I held was in the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville. And the activist there, the environmental activist there, the main one I would say is James Desmond, who you see in this photo. And uh, we filmed this workshop, but we also asked him during the workshop, how would you define environmental racism? And this is what he says. He says environmental racism 
is a practice as a practice has been locating industrial way sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. And I like that definition because it's simple, but at the same time, it's also layered because what James says here is that environmental racism is about disproportionality. Certain communities, racialized communities, non-white communities, but also uh, to a certain extent, poor white communities are often selected for the siting of dangerous industry. And when he says that they don't have a, a base to fight back, he's essentially saying that these are the communities, racialized communities, that lack economic, political, and social power. And because of that, they rarely get to be heard. They're certainly active. Um, they voice their opinions, but government tends to not hear them. And government is hesitant to act on some of their concerns. So it's a really, it's a really great uh, definition of environmental uh, racism that I think would make sense to individuals who feel that this is a, a very peculiar term. And it's also about environmental policies as well. So the spatial patterning of industries in certain communities is about environmental policies. So I just wanna provide you with a bit more academic definition of environmental racism that comes from uh, Dr. Robert Bullard. Uh, Dr. Robert Bullard is an African-American scholar. He teaches uh, at a university in Texas. And he talks similar to James about the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous and racialized communities, uh, talking about disproportionality once again, and the fact that it's about power, essentially. He also said it's about the lack of political power. These are the communities because of that intersection of race and class and socioeconomic status and the fact that, for example, people are living on reserves in the case of indigenous communities, in the case of uh, black communities in Nova Scotia, they tend to live in rural or semi-rural or out of the way or isolated places, which actually combined with race and class and socioeconomic status in many ways disempowers them or provides them with, or doesn't provide them with the kind of resources that they need from government. He also says that it's about the policies and we're talking specifically about environmental policies. So the outcome that we see, which is disproportionality, the spatial patterning of industries in certain communities is an outcome of environmental policies at departments of environment, for example. And those policies in many ways sanction the placement of these kind of harmful toxins, these life-threatening uh, toxic burdens in these communities. He also says it's about disproportionate negative impacts of policies. Uh, in many ways, uh, government is slow to address environmental contamination in these communities. These are communities, once again, that are low income, um, are dealing with various structural inequities, live in out of the way places. And there's a tardiness in a way um, in terms of government addressing uh, these concerns. And finally, environmental racism is allowed to manifest intergenerationally because it's precisely the communities that are most impacted by this issue, indigenous communities, black communities, that are actually excluded from decision-making boards and bodies, uh, excluded. You're not gonna find them at the table, at the decision-making table at ENGOs or other NGOs. So when we don't get the chance to hear their perspectives about how environmental racism uh, impacts them specifically, that doesn't get into policy. You know, you're not able to incorporate those experiences into policy and therefore environmental racism continues for decades in the case of Canada continues for over 70 years. I want to provide you with a few cases of environmental racism in Canada. So I'll start with uh, Nova Scotia because I've done most of my work in Nova Scotia. And this is Doreen Bernard. She's a friend uh, and uh, an environmental activist who has been with her community trying to halt uh, the implementation of a project by Alton Gas. And they've been wanting to implement a brine discharge pipeline in the community, with com which comes with various health effects. Um, over the past uh, seven years, I think the community started uh, opposing this project in 2014. They've been able to halt this project. Um, and I just actually found out today, there's a CBC News article I posted on my Twitter page that the project has been canceled. So this is amazing. I mean, over the past, since 2014, the, the government said that we're going to implement this brine discharge pipeline in your community. The community has engaged in a number of activities uh, over the years, online and in person, through marches, et cetera. And to hear today, 
that the project has finally been cancelled is a major achievement for this uh, Nova Scotian community. Peak to Landing First Nation. Peak to Landing First Nation, um, starting in 1967, the Northern Pulp Mill started dumping effluent into Boat Harbor in Peak to Landing First Nation. Boat Harbor became a toxic, extremely toxic site. Um, and over the years, particularly starting in 1980s, the government has made broken promises to that community. Uh, they've been uh, challenging the government around this particular issue since then. And in 2015, cleanup was promised um, in 2020. Um, at the end of 19, uh, 2019, the government said we cannot continue to make broken promises to this community. Um, the, the, the industry owners did not come back with a robust uh, of environmental assessment. Therefore, this site needs to be closed in 2020. And at the end of January 2020, the Northern Pulp Mill was finally closed. So this is another major achievement for a community that I think has been experiencing the worst case of environmental racism uh, over the years. We go to Ontario, Sarnia, Ontario, Chemical Valley. This is a bit of a stunning example of environmental racism because this is a an indigenous community, Amgen Wong First Nation, that has been dealing with over 60 petrochemical facilities set surrounding uh, their community within a 25 square kilometer area. And like all the other communities, this is a community that has concerns with, you know, cancers, reproductive illnesses, reproductive cancers, res respiratory illnesses, birth anomalies, or other reproductive uh, issues. So. This is a community that continues uh, to engage in mobilization around uh, environmental racism. You probably heard of Grassy Narrows First Nation. Uh, this is near Kenora, Ontario, and they've been uh, concerned about mercury contamination in the Wabagoon English River near their community for some time, since probably the late 1960s. A few years ago, uh, millions of dollars uh, went to the cleanup of Grassy Narrows First Nation. However, while there was cleanup, what people often tend to forget is that the health effects remain, right? So cancers, respiratory illness, those are still concerns in this community. I would say that the case or the example of environmental racism that has gotten a lot of attention over the past four years is in British Columbia. So this is Wet'suwet'en First Nation. Mass demonstrations, sit-ins and blockades have gripped parts of Canada over the movement to support the leaders of Wet'suwet'en First Nation who are opposed to this multi, sorry, multi-billion dollar pipeline project in Northern British Columbia. When people talk about environmental racism, they tend to forget about the fact that black communities are also impacted. Uh, black communities are often forgotten in this conversation, but when I started the project in Nova Scotia, I said to myself, well, uh, it seems to me that uh, environmental racism disproportionately impacts African Nova Scotians. And I, I didn't understand why. There's certainly other areas um, in Canada, but there's so many cases in Nova Scotia. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that not only are, are is this community, for example, Africville and other black communities racialized, they're black, but Af uh, in Nova Scotia, there are about 53, what is called historic African Nova Scotian communities. And these communities are rural or semi-rural, and they're isolated. Many of them don't have paved roads. They don't have a medical clinic or hospital. Uh, the residents need to drive to Halifax in order to get various goods. Uh, so these are communities that are lacking in various resources. And I think the combination of race and class and socioeconomic status and living in out of the way places, these things combine uh, to make it much easier for government uh, to place dangerous facilities in this community. A uh, historic case of environmental racism is Africville. Um, and we talk often in Nova Scotia and in Canada about the expropriation of African Nova Scotians from Africville, which started in the mid 1960s. So the government was trying to, the city of Halifax was trying to make way for industrial de development. So we call that of course, gentrification or urban renewal. They wanted the community out because they wanted to make way for industrial development. I believe they burned down the church uh, at night. And we know that church <laughs> is very important for many black communities. Um, some community members were moved out on a dump truck 
so a lot of a, a lot of shameful things in Nova Scotian history with respect to Black communities. So what I just described, those are examples of gentrification. But where environmental racism comes in is the fact that when they were making way for industrial development, what was left in its wake were a number of environmental and social hazards. And these included a fertilizer plant, a slaughterhouse, a tar factory, a stone and coal crushing plant, a cotton factory, a prison, three systems of railway tracks, and an open dump. I showed you a photo of James Desmond earlier, the African Nova Scotian environmental activist. This is his community or part of his community. This is uh, the dump in Lincolnville, a first generation landfill. You can call it a landfill or a dump, I guess. I mean, some people would argue that landfills are controlled and dumps, people just throw anything in there. So I see this as a dump in, in a way. Um, so this is their dump. I took a photo of this when I met with James for the workshop. Um, and yeah, it's a bit stunning. Uh, so they've had to deal with a first generation landfill uh, in 1974 and then a, then a second generation landfill that was placed on top of the first generation landfill in 2006. So of course the community is very concerned about the water seeping into this, this, the second generation landfill. Um, and like other communities, they say we ever since that first generation landfill was placed in our community, we've had rising cases of cancer and respiratory illness. And this is Shelburne. So Shelburne is featured in the Netflix documentary by way of Louise DeLille. I met Louise DeLille at the end of 2015 because I wanted to hire her to do workshops in her community about environmental racism because uh, you know, my work is community-based and I always like to find a respected leader uh, to do the research. And she sat down in my office and she said, Ingrid, I didn't know that this had a name. So you're calling it environmental racism. I said, yeah, well, not me, but Robert Bullard, the scholar in Texas and others call it environmental racism. She said, thank God, I finally have a name to hang this on. I didn't know what it was, but we've been concerned about high rates of cancer in my community. Do you, do you realize that about 98% of the people in my community have cancer? And I didn't believe her. Um, I didn't because never heard anything like that before. And then I remembered, I read an article about Cancer Alley in Louisiana, in the United States, a black community that was surrounded by petrochemical facilities and basically every member of that black community had cancer. So I said, it is possible then for something like this to be happening. And certainly since I've known Louise since 2015, there was a point where she was sending me emails every week saying, Ingrid, this person died and this person died and I can't believe this person died and the whole community is mourning. So it's a very stunning case of environmental racism and illness. High rates of cancer, as I said, but high rates of multiple myeloma specifically, which is a, which is a blood cancer. And this, I should say that uh, Shelburne got their dump loads. So after Louise did the workshops, they formed an NGO called the South End Environmental Injustice Society. And uh, that was in 2016 spring. And by December, 2016, they got that landfill closed for the first time. That landfill has been in the community since 1943. And the community says that everything went in there. Um, stuff from the military, I believe, uh, stuff from the hospital, like syringes and other waste. So this was a major achievement for the community, but like other communities, the health effects uh, remain. So I talked a lot about the health effects. Um, and there's a term of, you know, there's a term for disparities and health disparities that are outcomes of living close to toxic burdens. And that term is environmental health inequities. Environmental health inequities across racial dimensions have been well documented in the Canadian literature over at least the past 20 years. And that literature provides strong evidence that Indigenous, Black, and other racialized communities in Canada are exposed to greater health risks compared to white communities because they are more likely to be spatially clustered around waste disposal sites and other environmental hazards. And as I said, uh, these health issues include cancer, respiratory disease, gastrointestinal disease, reproductive illnesses, among other illnesses. But one thing that people often forget about is the emotional and mental health impacts of environmental racism. They often talk about the body in terms of these physical illnesses like cancer, but a forgotten issue, which interests me, is the psychological impacts, the psychosocial stressors that result from environmental racism. And that was highlighted for me 
when I was part of a press conference along with Louise DeLeal uh, from Shelburne. And she said, you know, there's a mental health toll in our community because we live near the dump. So people see us as the dump. They think we are the dump people. Therefore that impacts our self-esteem. Uh, there's a bit of a taboo in my community because we're looked at in a particular way. Not only are we black, but we are the black people that live near the dump. And in a subsequent uh, workshop that I did, actually a workshop I did uh, this year in the spring uh, in Shelburne to look at the mental health, to do a bigger study on the mental health impacts of environmental racism. Most everybody at that workshop said the same thing, that there was a stigma in our community. Uh, people saw us as unworthy. They saw us as the dump or the people who live near the dump. Consequently, a lot of our young people are on drugs. They have low self-esteem about who they are. So uh, I think environmental stress or the psych psychosocial impacts of environmental racism is a very much of an understudied issue, and I'm hoping to contribute to that literature more in the future. One of the things I've noticed, you know, I, it's important to talk about climate change, but one of the things I noticed is that people use the term in, environmental racism and climate change uh, interchangeably, which is problematic because they are separate issues, but they are connected. Sometimes I've, I'd be asked to deliver a presentation person would approach me and say, Ingrid, can you talk about your project? Can you talk about environmental racism? And then when I get to the event, uh, we're being asked questions about climate change. And I'm like, how, do, how did I get here? I thought they wanted to learn about the Enrich Project. Uh, so it's, it's not the same, they're connected, but completely different issues. One issue is about pollution and contamination, which is environmental racism. The other issue is about climate change, which is about climate change, right? But the way they're connected first is the fact that Pollutants and contaminants certainly give rise to um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is part of the climate change discourse, right? We talk about greenhouse gas emissions and the need to reduce that, uh, certainly by 2030 or the year 2050. So that's how pollution and contamination would contribute to something as, uh, as uh, nefarious as greenhouse gas emissions that we need to reduce. So that's how they're connected in one way. But the other way that they're connected is that the same communities that are impacted and affected by environmental racism, racialized communities, are the same communities that are impacted first and worst uh, by climate change, right? For several reasons. Um, so indigenous, black and racialized communities are vulnerable to climate change precisely because these are the communities that struggle with various structural determinants of health independent of, aside from climate change. So long-standing, historically embedded structural inequities like uh, poor housing, uh, living in under-resourced areas, low socioeconomic status, income insecurity, poverty, poor public infrastructure. I'm not sure if I said food insecurity, ongoing colonization, a legacy of racism, all of these are structural inequities. And these are communities that deal with that independent of climate change. So when we ask these communities, or we say in a very normative fashion, we need to adapt to climate change, we need to prepare for it, then we have to ask whether or not these communities, racialized communities, have the proper resources to prepare for climate change impacts. And typically no, because these are the communities that tend to be under-resourced and struggling with all of these structural inequities that I mentioned. So before climate change hits, these communities are most likely to be, or more likely to be unequipped and underprepared to deal with climate change when it hits. So that's one way, reason why these communities might be hit by climate change devastation first and worst. Uh, on the other end of it, after climate change hits, these communities, because they lack those resources, because they struggle with these longstanding structural inequities, don't have many of the resources to fight back, uh, to address, to survive climate change. So think uh, again about um, Katrina, think about hurricanes that have hit black communities in the United States. And we know many of these communities are low income communities and take a long time to come back from climate change impacts. So when people say, and have said to me, why are you making this about race? Aren't we all impacted by climate change? I said, yes. Climate doesn't choose specific people based on race, but what happens is that based on gender, 
race, culture, class, so socioeconomic status, um, our ability to adapt to it, our ability to come back from it, to survive it will be different essentially because of what we're dealing with before climate change hits and all those structural inequities. Um, so in that way, environmental racism and climate change are very much connected, right? Because re regardless of the topic you're talking about, environmental racism or climate change, it hits communities that are unequipped in many ways, socially, economically, and politically, they're often uh, not heard. So I believe then, and many people believe, that the climate change narrative has to be much more inclusive and intersectional um, because resource shortages uh, hit these communities most. But we also have to have a gendered analysis. So when I talk about intersectional, we've got to look at race and culture and class and gender and geography, right? So many times these resource shortages impact uh, women very differently from men. In general, women, uh, the category of women, for example, are the lowest income, poorest category of individuals in the world. Around the world, uh, women suffer from poverty and income insecurity more than any other gendered group, right? So that means that they're more likely to be unprepared uh, when climate change hits. When we think of developing countries, uh, women are more likely to be responsible based on socially constructed norms or roles that women play in various countries, more likely to be responsible for gathering food and gathering water. That means that they're exposed in a very unique way and not necessarily worse, I guess, but in a unique way uh, from men, right? Because people are doing different jobs. They have different roles, socially constructed roles within the home, within the workplace, within society. So this is why we need to put a gendered lens on uh, both environmental racism and climate change because it, it, it's experienced in a very, very different way. So the term that people are using uh, today is climate justice, right? We need to have a climate justice framework in, in order to understand intersectionality. Why are people experiencing climate change impacts, climate change devastation in very different ways? When you put that climate justice lens on the issue, then it's very easy to articulate uh, why certain communities might be hit first or worst in some cases. And geography, I don't want to forget geography is very, very important. We think of indigenous communities living in high latitudes, right? Where they live, geography, issues of place and space have bearing on the fact that you might be hit by climate change impacts first, as is the case uh, in many indigenous communities. Ecological grief. While I feel that the issue of uh, the mental health impacts of environmental racism is understudied, there are scholars that are starting to look at the mental health impacts of climate change, and they use a term for that, which is climate grief or climate anxiety or ecological grief. So the impact of climate change on our internal worlds um, is increasingly being looked at in Canada and around the world. There's a growing body of evidence that, that demonstrates that climate change and its effects are linked to elevated rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, post-traumatic stress, and a host of negative emotions, including anger, hopelessness, despair, and a feeling of loss. Researchers have dubbed these feelings all under that category of ecological grief. So I want to talk now and probably end with um, what the, e, the NGO that I founded back in 20, 20, 2012 has been engaged in to address uh, both environmental racism and climate change. As was mentioned earlier, this uh, acronym refers to the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project. I started it in 2012 after an environmental activist came to me and he said, um, I'd like you to start a project on environmental racism. You know, he was an activist doing a lot of work around the issue, but he was leaving. He was going to the United States and he just wanted to ensure that the issue was sustained, I guess, that it didn't fall, it, it didn't disappear. And he probably thought that an academic with funding, you know, could, uh, could uh, sustain uh, a project on environmental racism. So I, I agreed uh, to take it on. What I decided to do was to design 
the Enrich project as a community-based, community-led project uh, that is collaborative, that's multi-method, that's interdisciplinary, that's multi-sectoral, and that's multimedia. And one of the first things that I thought was important was to create awareness. Once again, as I said earlier, I got asked the same question early on. What's environmental racism? Is, does that really exist? What a weird name. What does that mean? And I thought, well, I still need to do some work then. Um, so I continue up to this day to put on a lot of uh, engagement events, public engagement events, film screenings, community workshops, academic and public symposiums. Um, and other events to create awareness and inform. They're also a very good way to get volunteers. It's a good way when you increase people's awareness about a particular topic, then you at times increase their empathy. And when you increase their empathy, then they feel mobilized. And when they feel mobilized, often they come to me, they send me an email and they say, I, I attended that event you held last night. How can I get involved? And that is music to my ears, right? Because this is not an easy issue, but after I did many of these public engagement events, I got a young person saying, I attended your event last night, didn't know anything about it, how can I get involved? Uh, so I continue to do that. And it's for me, it's about I can you know, delivering presentations like this one, but also organizing events where community members, policymakers, or government people um, give their perspectives, different angles on the issue of environmental racism. Of course, as a scholar, as a professor, I have to write, I have to publish. So this is a book that uh, came out in 2018. It's a book I wrote that's based on the Enrich Project, but it also gives voice to the communities that I've been working with specifically in Nova Scotia. But I would say that while Nova Scotia provides a case study in this book, Nova Scotia provides also a jumping off point for me to also discuss cases of environmental racism across Canada, in Ontario, in Saskatchewan, in BC, in Alberta, uh, I talk about all of these uh, places and I talk about cases of environmental racism in, in all of those provinces. Um, I focus a lot on community mobilizing over the past 70 years. What kinds of grassroots organizing have these communities engaged in? What were their successes? What were some of the things that they didn't achieve? Uh, just to show their struggles. Uh, in chapter five, I focus exclusively on the health and mental health impacts of environmental racism. Another data collection kind of tool that I've used is mapping, GIS analysis. So I worked with my research assistant in 2016 to produce a map that you will find on my project website. One layer is for Mi'kmaq communities, the indigenous communities. The other layer is for African Nova Scotian communities. And what this documents and what this visualizes is that these are communities that are indeed close to incinerators, landfills, dumps, et cetera. So as I said, there were a lot of naysayers in the beginning. They doubted what I was doing. They doubted the reality of environmental racism. And this is great, this map, because it provides visual evidence about the reality of environmental racism across Nova Scotia. Um, so the red dots are for the indigenous community. The blue dots are for the black community. Um, and it shows that, yes, indeed, these communities are close to these sites, but it doesn't say that white communities are not. Of course, white communities are also. Uh, but what this shows based on the, uh, the population is that black and indigenous communities are disproportionately located to these sites. Uh, with my coalition, the new coalition I founded, we are doing, we are using this map to create a Canada-wide map. Uh, so we're going to do exactly what I've done here, but for all of Canada, and then we also want to make it a bit fancy. So we're going to, up, we want to upload audio and video and text and, and, and connect it to social media. We have a lot of plans and we are in the process of doing that right now across Canada, not just for environmental racism, but for climate change impacts as well. In 2016, I decided that it's important to give something back to Lincolnville because I didn't think that the landfill would ever be redirected, which is what the community has wanted for years. Redirect this landfill to somewhere else. We don't want it in our community. And I thought, well, I just don't think that's gonna happen. So I thought, how can we support the community? And I realized that the community has been asking for water testing for years, but they didn't want the government to do it because they didn't trust the government. They thought the government would say, everything is okie dokie, everything is fine. So I said, well, they'll probably trust researchers because you know we're not government. and and I'm about giving them the truth, right, through data. So I formed a little working group with a hydrogeologist, 
and some environmental science students. And we did a profile on the community. We found some maps on the government website and we tested their water. We took samples of their water and one of our partners tested it. And we went back to the community, shared the results, did a workshop on how to manage your drinking water supply. It worked really well. So in 2017, we decided to turn that small project into an NGO. And that NGO is called Rural Water Watch, which you see here. And what we do is we test water in rural Nova Scotian communities. I've also consulted with EcoJustice, various offices across Canada. We have one now in Halifax. Um, and EcoJustice looks at legal remedies to address environmental concerns. So when they came to Halifax, opened an office, I worked with them. I gave them a kind of rundown on the communities in Nova Scotia that were dealing with issues, and they have been working with those communities. Late 2019, I partnered with Climate Action Services to do my first climate change project in the African Nova Scotian communities in Nova Scotia. Uh, this is to look at climate change adaptation. Really what I wanted to look at was the, those intersections. How do race, class, living in an isolated community prepare you or not prepare you to engage in climate change adaptation? Because that messaging is very normative. It assumes that everybody can adapt to climate change when certain communities don't have resources. So these were simply workshops, but the community enjoyed this. And I'm hoping at some point to, to kind of use the workshop to launch into bigger studies on that particular issue. In 2018, actor Elliot Page reached out to me on Twitter. Well, I shouldn't say reached out. He was just promoting everything. He was promoting my book, uh, supporting my Enrich Project, supporting the women on the front lines. And I didn't really believe it when I first saw the posting. I didn't realize it was the actor. I went back about three weeks later and I said, it is. Um, shocked. I was shocked. And I reached out, I DM'd him on Twitter and I said, thank you very much. I want to thank you for all that you're doing to support my work and the women. And, it, and he said, I want to use my platform, my celebrity to help. I don't know how. We had a few conversations at the end of 2018, early 2019. We all decided on small video clips that could be posted on Twitter. Um, Elliot came up April 13th, 2019, filmed all of us across six days. And then we all decided, no, this should be a 70 minute documentary because the issue is too important. We keep saying that we wanna raise awareness. Are we really gonna raise awareness by posting 10 minute clips on Twitter? So we all decided 70 minute documentary, take it to the Toronto International Film Festival. I'm, I was thinking big. I was thinking Robert Redford's <laughs> Film Festival, the Berlin Film Festival. I was going really big and it happened. Uh, Cameron Bailey accepted this very rough, not elegant film. And the film was screened at the Toronto Festival, uh, September 9th, 2019. And there we are on the red carpet. I think that's the Elgin Theater. And later we found out it was going to Netflix. Uh, we found out uh, October, October, end of October that it was going to Netflix and it started streaming on Netflix at the end of March, 2020. Both of these things have been a gift. Uh, TIFF and Netflix because of course, global attention. And I received emails from people around the world saying to me that the women in the film have been so inspiring once again, how can I help, right? This is what's great about knowledge sharing. It's like, what can I do? Or I'm from Nova Scotia, I had no idea that this, this was happening in my backyard. Tell me more about it, how can I help? That's exactly what a community-based project wants. And finally, uh, as I think I mentioned or touched on late last year, a Toronto resident by the name of Nao Charles reached out to me and he said, I know about the Enrich Project, that's all great, but have you ever thought of going beyond Nova Scotia? And I said, yeah, I have, but I just don't have the capacity. He said, well, why don't we do something together? So we co-founded uh, what is now called, we changed the name, the Canadian Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice. Uh, we had our first meeting December of last year, and we brought together various organizations in the climate and environmental field like David Suzuki and Eco Justice and East Coast Environmental Law Association and et cetera, et cetera, to share resources, share skills, share knowledge with the end goal of addressing environmental racism and climate change impacts, not just in indigenous and black communities, but all racialized communities, immigrant communities across Canada. Um, right now, we are looking to get this bill passed. Um, it's been a journey. Uh, it was first a provincial Nova Scotia bill. I helped develop it with uh, then MLA, Lenore Zan. She then became in 2018 an MP um, and she turned the bill, Nova Scotia bill into a federal bill last year. 
uh, called Bill C-230, introduced it in the House of Commons February 26th of last year. It went to second reading. It was approved this year. It was approved at amendments. And then, of course, the election was called. And that means all private members' bills die. They die. So this bill is, is essentially gone. However, on Tuesday this week, we sent a letter to uh, Trudeau asking him to reintroduce this bill as a government bill rather than a private member's bill because government bills go through parliament much more quickly. Uh, so we're waiting to hear back. If we hear back, we may not. Uh, but that was that's our strategy right now in terms of just reminding him, reminding Trudeau that actually he, or I think it was Wilkinson, the environment minister, did make a statement, a quote, that they're very interested in seeing this bill pass. So this letter was just a reminder congratulating Trudeau on his win, but also saying, do you remember what you said about this bill? Uh, so we will wait, but this has been a major kind of, uh, it's been a challenge over the past, uh, since 2015, getting any type of environmental racism legislation passed in Canada. Final words, if I have time. Do I have time? No? Okay. You can say your final words. Okay. <laughs> So there is a link uh, between corporate power, privilege, environmental racism, and climate change. Therefore, any response to environmental racism and climate change that does not recognize the complex ways in which social, economic, and political systems result in privilege and disadvantage in ways that give some people a pass and make others pay will be meaningless. It's up to those with power and not the people impacted by these injustices to address the problem of environmental racism and climate inequities. Those who have the most influence and the strongest voice should be part of the solution. If real action on these issues is to be realized, it must be premised on an understanding that the climate crisis and environmental racism requires rapid, large-scale political action and systemic change. And it's the companies and institutions responsible for the crisis that need to pay. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. What a dynamic, informative presentation, Dr. Thank Walton. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a number of questions for you. Um, there, of course, folks are very appreciative. Um, we heard that um, one, one of our colleagues, um, Viv Vivian, said that she wasn't even aware of uh, environmental racism. So uh, thank you so much um, for that. She thinks it's everyone's responsibility to begin to um, educate the next generation and wanting to know how, uh, how we can help um, in terms of raising awareness. The best ways is uh, when we as a coalition or any environmental organization, could be David Suzuki, when we put out calls to action to respond. So for example, with this letter, we sent it out through Twitter, I sent it out through LinkedIn, asking people to sign on, right? Those small actions, whether it's a petition signing, a letter, calling your MP are really important because if the government feels that you as a member of the public doesn't care, then why should they care? So it's those actions, those immediate things that you can do in terms of sign a petition. Um, because you know, when we put out a petition to coalition, we got 12,000 signatures. I put out petitions before and we didn't get that many. And then it was approved at amendments. You know, I really think that when the coalition pulled together and we talked to media and I talked to Greg Fergus, who's the black, is the head of the black parliamentary caucus, I, we did little actions. And for it to be approved at amendments, this is the furthest it ever went. I had emails from members of the public saying, uh, please pass this bill because they CC'd me on it. That type of action, it gets attention. But if you show the government that you don't really care or you're not doing anything, then why should they care, right? So it's about putting pressure. So I would say, uh, get onto the Facebook and website pages of key environmental organizations and when they have a call to action, take it seriously. Very good. Um, what is your definition of environmental justice? And how is that connected to or responds to environmental racism? So environmental justice is often used interchangeably with environmental racism, which used to really concern me because when I went to Nova Scotia, people were using the term environmental justice. And I thought, are you scared to say environmental racism? Um, 
So this mm. is how I like to describe it. Because why are you saying it's environmental justice when the issue is still there? There's no justice. So for me, justice is, you know, when you go to the doctor and you have a condition and you want the doctor to give you a diagnosis and you will take the medication that you prescribe once you know what the diagnosis is, right? That's the condition. You've got the condition and the illness. Environmental racism is the illness, is the condition. Uh, when you take the medication that he prescribes, once you know what the illness is, because you're not going to take any medication, that's the solution. So environmental justice and the solution, for example, could be the legislation that I just talked about, right? They're very separate. We've got to talk about the condition and what causes it and how it manifests before we're rushing to talk about the justice part of it, which I think Canadians, you know, when you look at the literature, everything is justice. I'm like, where's the justice? It's still an issue, right? So the justice is the apparatus, the tools, the actions that you will take in order to achieve environmental justice, which could be the petition signing, legislation, hopefully at some point, and all the actions that I talked about earlier that will achieve the justice. So distinct, completely distinct issues. But if you look at the literature in Canada, not in the States, you will rarely see them name it as racism because of course in Canada, there's no racism, right? Mm, we hear you. So there are two questions around the role of government. So I'll, I'll put them together. Does our government address environmental racism and climate change? And um, in your, in, in your sense, what is the most urgent action among many actions you would want to see the federal government taking to address environmental racism? Okay, can so you repeat are, the first question? Are, 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 are governments at different levels um, doing anything about environmental racism? And if so, or if not, what would be the one thing you'd want to see, particularly from the federal government? I would see government at different levels are not taking action on environmental racism. However, they are taking action on climate change. And because the way that they've uh, conceptualized climate change is something that's normative and doesn't have a racial lens, right? Mm. So Department of Nova Scotia Department of Environment, they're doing major stuff on climate change, but it lacks a racial analysis. So they like to keep it at, oh, we're all impacted by climate change. Therefore, everybody's doing stuff on climate change because it, they don't do it from a racial lens. Once you ask them to do it from a racial lens, I wonder if all the funding they're getting uh, would go to climate change projects. So right now it's all about climate change. I realize that it's a it's an important topic. However, I think because environmental racism is about race, that's why climate change gets more attention than environmental racism. Because once you start focusing on racialized communities and you take the attention away from the majority community, people get very uh, people get get very concerned. Um, at different levels of government, I don't think enough is doing. People are doing enough, government is doing enough about environmental racism. Um, I'm seeing some change, however. So I was contacted the day after I sent that letter to, to Trudeau by an NDP, an NDP MP who I noticed was sitting on the calls when we were at the debates at the second reading. And she said, Ingrid, I would like to, I would like to do a bill, an environmental racism bill, but this is for the NDP. Uh, so we will be meeting, and she was extremely supportive uh, at second reading of environmental racism. She teaches a course on it. She read my book. She ed she's white. She educated herself. So it was great to see that happening. Um, when I approached different people, MPs, their agenda items, environmental racism was never on the kind of agenda. Mm. You know, whether it be black politicians, I have to say, I have to call them out. You know, they had this very constricted kind of priorities. Black policing, I understand that's important, you know, but it's anti-black policing. It, and they don't seem to see that environmental, black people don't seem to see environmental racism as important. It's never on the priority list. So I think we're moving too slowly, but I, I see things changing certainly over the past nine years very slowly. Oh, absolutely. And I think as we speak about issues of climate change, so thank you for that, for that very candid response. And I think as we speak to issues of environmental racism here in Canada and, and globally and around issues of climate change, as it has to do with immigration policy, right? Because we know that climate change will drive 
um, forced migration. Um, and so how is Canada going to respond? We're watching what's happening in Haiti as an example, right? Um, and, and the lack of a robust response um, to what's happening uh, in, in that country based on climate. Um, your, the last question for you is a comment and a question from our colleague Alos Abis. Thank you so much for the PAC presentation and sharing with us your important work, Dr. Waldron. For advocates, service providers, and researchers, how can we conduct research with people impacted by environmental racism in ways that are ethical and transformative and, and do not produce tra trauma porn or contribute environmental grief without care and justice? Lots to unpack there. Yeah, this is a challenge for academia because people see us as exploitative. People see academia as exploitative. We take people's data, we don't return to their community, and we publish, which we have to do, right? Because publishing is actually really important. That's why I think any project, whether it be environmental racism or any project having to do with racialized peoples, should always be through a community based lens. I do my work through a community based lens. And one of the ways that I do that is to identify a community leader like Louise DeLeo and Shelburne, who's respected. And I enable them to do the focus group, I enable them to do the interview. There are also ethical protocols, and that means that at times you have to identify a what I would call a community informant or somebody who is from the community who sits at the table with you at the beginning, not at the end, not in the middle, but that person is responsible for saying, Ingrid, you're doing it wrong, or Ingrid, these are the kind of values and mores in my community. Let me tell you about it so you do it uh, correctly. So right when you start, you have an advisory committee. Typically, it's made up of other researchers, faculty. Uh, but you want to have what is called a community informant who could advise you, tell you where you're going wrong. Um, so it has to be community led. You've got to be you've got to be able to provide the tools to community members to lead it. You're there to provide the resources because the truth is community members know what they want. They just don't have all the big grants that I have. Right. So if I can provide a grant, to enable somebody to do the workshop, to, to lead their community, that's what you're there for. You have to know when, when to step away and to allow the community to lead. Um, so the knowledge sharing, how you share the knowledge, how you write up the report, how you write up the publications need to be led. And if not led by the communities, because they're very, very busy, uh, they need to review it. They have to be with you at every step of the way. So community-based research is about, should be about, and not everybody's successful, and I'm not always successful, is about power sharing at every stage of research, which doesn't happen typically with non-community-based research. What a wonderful, wonderful way to end this great conference of ours. Thank you so much, Dr. Waldron, uh, for your speak, for the knowledge, for your activism around this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We will certainly be reading your book and promoting your work. And of course, you'll be hearing again from Okasi. We have to continue this conversation because the work that you're doing is so intimately connected to the advocacy work that we're doing in terms uh -huh. of Canada's role in the world and how Canada responds to this uh -huh. issue here at home to racialized and indigenous communities, including black communities, yes. and abroad as well in terms of where we put our priorities and how yes. we grow up as Canadians in this world. Uh -huh. So thank you so very, very much. We truly appreciate you spending your Friday afternoon with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. And folks, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for making people, power, impact the future of immigration. And at Okasi, we spell immigration I am slash migration because we want to pay attention to the migrant piece of immigrant um, as well that often gets lost in our work. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you so much for staying. So thank you so much for vibrant, knowledgeable conversations over this last two days. The future of immigration in Canada must be an ongoing conversation. We've heard the urgency on many of the issues discussed over the last few days. We've heard that we must find ways to work in solidarity, including from Dr. Waldron, with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. Okasi has committed and will continue to do work in solidarity around the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 213 demands from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh, inquiry 
and to hold the government, the federal government to account in the full implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UN DRIP. We heard that there is an urgency to regularize the status of those who are undocumented in Canada. We need affordable, adequate, safe housing. And when we talk about adequate, we're talking about size, right? Not Immigrants are not coming in necessarily with a nuclear family. We live in multi-generational homes. Decent work, including a living wage, must be one of our rallying cries for those of us who work in the sector and for those who work in other sectors. Women's leadership, and the urgency of closing the gender and racial wage gap that exists at all levels of our sector and the broader nonprofit sector. Access to trades and professions, particularly credential recognition. We have opened up a window in having the provincial government table legislation around this. Our role in the next few months is to push for this legislation to become law before the writ is dropped for the provincial election here in Ontario, scheduled for June 2nd, 2022. We also heard a call to build solidarity across various communities and movements to address issues of anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Muslim hate, and anti-Semitism. We were educated about the need to incorporate an intersectional lens around the work that we do, particularly with disability movements to inform our political programs and strategies. And we also heard that we must take care of ourselves. That before we can offer support, before we can take care of others, we must take care of ourselves. And so I wanna thank my colleagues who modeled that for us over the last two days and started off their day by attending our wellness sessions. Thank you. We have much work to do, but I leave this conference energized and hopeful that you as my colleagues in the sector, as workers and advocates have the best interest of migrants, refugees and immigrants, international students, folks who are marginalized here in our country that you have our, their best interests at heart. Thank you for a wonderful two days and have a great weekend. Thank you again, Dr. Waldron, for showing up and hanging out with us for a while. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Cassie. Have a great day, Stephanie. Thank you for a wonderful conference. Once again, thank you to our fabulous interpreters. We know how difficult it is as we use language that's not always familiar, both in terms of translation into English and French, but especially our ASL uh, interpreters as well. Thank you to our techies. Thank you to my colleagues at Ocasi for once again showing up, as I said earlier. Thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, we've, been, we've been getting lots of questions from folks about wanting recordings. All of the plenary sessions and most of the concurrent workshops have been recorded. We're going to clean up the recordings and it will be posted on the YouTube, Ocasi's YouTube channel. Once they're up, Stephanie will send out a note to everyone who is registered for the conference to let you know that you can go to the Ocasi YouTube channel and find the recording of the two-day conference. We will also be sending you an evaluation form around the conference. Please complete it. For those of you who did not get a chance to complete the evaluation for your workshops, we're also going to try and attach a link to the workshop so you can go to, to the Ocasi website, go in when you have some time and tell us how wonderful or not the workshops were, but I am sure they were all wonderful. So thank you once again. Thank you for a fabulous two days. Have a great safe weekend. Be well.